the stump of this sermon. Oh, we've got to see what to ask. I don't do that. I've, I've had to say this in other churches. If it says in the, if it says in the order of service, sit, sit. If it's your habit to sit, sit. You know, you're, you're all grown up. You don't need to be told what to do or when to stand up. You know. Right. Now, I noticed that um, my text for this morning, <clears throat> and I'm a bit croaky, in the version I read at home was, then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always. And not to lose heart. Pray always and not to lose heart. In, this, in the version that I read just now, it says, always pray and not give up. It's the same thing, isn't it? Same thing. Um, I love Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, and I know that uh, Philip's. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. The idea of stone hearts being made into flesh and having the, heart, the law of God in their heart, not just as a ritual. They shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to another, know the Lord, for they shall all know me the greatest to the leetest. They shall know me because it's, I'm in their heart and I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. And it's an intimate relationship which struck me as, I, as Philip was reading this. He mentions though I was a husband to them. It's that sort of a relationship. Relationship with God, you know. Spouse. That's a close relationship. Sometimes we see in the Bible the relationship is described as father and child. Other prophets say you know, uh, that, uh, that God took the reins of the child and taught him to walk. But I know I'm getting distracted. Right, the Old Testament, <laughs> how long have we got? The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, of course, is best remembered as someone who prophesies doom and gloom, disaster and catastrophe. And as a result of that, Jeremiah had a really bad time simply saying what he saw was coming down the line. And the truth of the matter is that even today, people simply don't want to hear the reality of the situation. But in Jeremiah's time, the pro he prophesied that things were going to get very, very bad indeed for the nation. And there was a, a national disaster, a catastrophe. The kingdom of Judah was overthrown, people were taken off into captivity in Babylon, and of course Jeremiah the prophet wasn't isolated from it all, he, uh, he was part of it. He shared the same faith as his people, enduring as he saw it, God's wrath. But then, after many years, when the time was wrong, Jeremiah was able to offer the people words of real hope and encouragement. Yes, he reasoned, God has indeed punished us severely, but he has not abandoned us. He still loves us. He still loves us. And there is hope. They did have a future to look forward to. So when we read those words from the Gospel, Jesus told them a parable about the need to pray always not to lose heart. They're words of encouragement. Now, to my mind, that parable is basically about persistence and perseverance. Now, whether you believe that God, in a God who responds um, and intervenes in our lives is, is a personal matter, I don't want to go there. But I do know that being a follower of Jesus actually requires perseverance and persistence. It really does. And this got me wondering, what does hope look like? What does hope look like? It seems to me that hope differs considerably depending on who is doing the hoping and the context that they're in. Hope also differs depending on 
just how realistic we are and what people are willing to do. Hmm? The person who lives in hope that one day they'll have a huge win on the National Lottery is living in a passive hope. Passive. They can't influence which numbers are drawn or not. It's pure chance. And the odds against them of getting this enormous win are really, really remote. They're living a pipe dream. They're hoping that something will happen, but they can't do anything about it. On the other hand, a person who hopes to achieve something realistic and is prepared to be proactive, hmm, do something about it, and work towards the goal, has a far greater chance of making their hopes a reality. So, the youth with a passion for motorbikes who hopes to become a mechanic can do something about it if he really wants to. You know, he can enrol in the local college, do the local course, pass the exam, gain the certificate, and then look for a job. Yes, he can make his hopes real. The teenager who's mad about working with animals and hopes to become a vet can do something about it work to get the A-levels, get into university, and persevere, because it's a long, hard, difficult course, but persevere, remembering what inspired her in the first place, to start the course, and then finally qualify, make her hope a reality. It's about expecting things to happen and doing something to make them. So what's the Christian hope? What's our Christian hope? Well, I think it's something to do, isn't it, with the relationship with God that is available and made known to us through Jesus. It's something to do with having an awareness of that spiritual relationship with God that gives us a bigger vision of life and gives us a purpose. It's a relationship that gives us hope and gives us confidence that however dire and challenging our present circumstances may be, ultimately there will always be a better future. And why? Because the light that has come into the world in Jesus and which illuminates the lives of those who choose to follow him, followers of Jesus, that spiritual light is stronger than any secular darkness. This Christ light, this spiritual illumination, is given freely to those who will accept it. And we accept it passively. We don't accept it on our own terms. We come to Christ as we are to accept a gift. We come in faith. We come in hope. We come in expectation. But having received, having seen and received this Christ light, this light of we are each of us called to be proactive, to be bearers of the Christ light, sharers of the gospel, co-workers in God's kingdom. Yes, we are called, each one of us, to make things happen for God. Like the prophets of old, one of the tasks of leadership in the church is to say things that people don't really want to speak the truth, to name reality. Now this church has an ideal opportunity at the beginning of Philip's ministry in this wide event is to face up to the challenges and the opportunities of being the church here in Sportwick. Let's not face ourselves, there are many challenges you have to face, but there are opportunities. Philip brings fresh eyes a new vision, an energy, and a determination to fan the flame of faith in this place, in this village. But he can't do it alone. As co-workers in God's kingdom, it is your mission too. Hmm? Now, underpinning the life of any church community should be its spiritual life and the spiritual death of its 
fundamentals and that we don't build spiritual depth in our lives <coughs> if our only exposure to the Bible is on a Sunday good spiritual worship is essential to sustain the Christian life people say oh you don't have to go to church to be a Christian yes you do yes you do because being a Christian is about being part of a community hmm? it's about being part of a body the body of Christ that gathers and has a shared purpose and a shared vision so yes we do need to come together to worship and to lift our hearts to God An accessible worship can in itself be a tool for mission. Because if people who don't normally come to church experience something good on a Sunday morning, it gets them thinking. It might even inspire them. It might even inspire them. When you go home, read the epistle on the back of the leaflet from Timothy. It'll speak to you. It says, Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. To be inspired by Scripture, we actually have to read it for ourselves. Not just listen to somebody reading read a very short passage on a Sunday morning. We actually have to read it for ourselves. We have to study it, to allow it to challenge us and to stretch us. And the truth is that all the evidence shows that when Christians or inquirers meet together during the week, preferably in a, in a warm, comfortable home <coughs> with tea and coffee, biscuits or a glass of wine, nothing wrong with that, a glass of wine helps us to relax and unwind and to share. When people do that, get together, to read the Bible together, perhaps to follow a study book with guidance notes, when they have the opportunity to ask questions, to express doubts, to wrestle with questions of faith and to pray together for one another, when these things happen, faith does grow. Faith grows, confidence grows, and hope realistic hope is rekindled as we look to the future and there is a future for the church in this place though it might not be as we expect hmm? the world changes and the church needs to change so as I draw to a close I'll leave you with a question what might your hopes for the future be for this church? What do you hope for? Think about it. What do you hope for? What are you going to do about it? Because it's a question that together with Philip, you really must address. And sooner rather than later. As you face up to the challenges and the reality of sustaining a viable Christian worshipping community in this place, as you hopefully reach out to the community with hope, with love and in faith, recognising that there is hope for the future, it requires you to make it a reality. And so I leave you with those words of Jesus. Pray always. Pray always. And do not lose heart. There is hope in Christ. And he challenges you to make your hopes a reality in this place. And to him be the praise and the glory.